Hi everyone. Um, so today is the last lecture of lossless compression, and uh, so we'll look at one of the most most important lossless compression technique, LZ77. And uh, in the second half today, we will look at some sort of to conclude the lossless compression part. We will look at some practical tips on lossless compression based on mine and other people's experience uh, working with compression. Um, so in the last couple of lectures, we have been looking at uh, compression for non-IID data. And uh, we, we started looking at conditional entropy, right, uh, conditional probabilities. And then we went into probability rate, which was, for the purpose of this lecture, all you need to know is it's the fundamental limit of lossless compression for stationary sources. Uh, just like entropy is the fundamental limit for IID sources and conditional entropy is the fundamental limit for Markov sources, right? And if you recall, we defined the con uh, entropy rate in two ways. Uh, one is like the incremental conditional probability. What is the limit as n goes to infinity? And the other is that if you think in terms of blocks of size n, what is the average entropy per block as n becomes larger and larger? And then in the last lecture, we looked at context-based arithmetic coding where we will learn this very important concept that prediction implies compression, right? If you have a good predictor, that's a good compressor. And then we looked at some specific models for prediction, kth order adaptive arithmetic coding, which you had a quiz question on. And we look at some more advanced models uh, in, in less detail. But then we looked at the most advanced model of all in more detail, which was the large language models. And we looked at how you can push compression to its limits. Uh, all of this was based on very carefully modeling the data or learning the probability distribution of the data. Today we will see a very different technique where you don't, don't do that basically and still achieve excellent results. Okay, so lots to cover today. So what I'm going to do is I, I will not spend a lot of time on the quiz. So for the first question, you had a sequence that you wanted to encode with a first order adaptive arithmetic coding, right? We did an example of this in class, very similar. And you will have some practice in your uh, homework as well. But what I did was I created this table for you just to make sure you understand like how, how to do this, right? So at every step you have the previous symbol, you have the current symbol, you have the counts before, and then you update the counts so you get the counts after. Uh, and, and yeah, please take a look at these. Uh, unless anybody has any specific question on the quiz, I will skip this question for now. Okay, yeah, uh, please talk to us after class uh, if, you, if you didn't get any of these or think these answers are not what you thought they were. The second question or the first question in the quiz, maybe let's, let's talk about that a bit more. So the first question was, you know that your data is roughly second order Markov, but do not know the actual transition probabilities. And we asked you whether you should use context-based arithmetic coding or adaptive arithmetic coding. How many think it's the first one? Second one? Okay. So correct, right? Adaptive just means that you don't assume some initial model that you know and you learn the model from the data, which just seems more appropriate for when you don't know the sequence, uh, the probabilities. Here, it's a third order Markov and you know the exact distribution. So since you know the distribution, there is no point in like trying to learn it from the data. That's just less efficient. And therefore here the answer is you just do the context-based arithmetic coding. There was a third question in the quiz which we had to remove because I didn't cover the material in time. You know nothing about the input data. So you have like literally no idea what's in there. What would you do in that case, right? And actually this is what you will do, LZ77. That is the topic of today's lecture where you don't make any assumptions about your data. Um, okay, so before I start, any, any questions on the previous material? Okay. Okay. Did his 1948 paper, people worked on IID sources. They did this context-based stuff. But nobody had an idea whether for a general stationary distribution, can you have a compressor that works for any distribution irrespective of like you don't need to know the distribution in advance. And then there were a 
a sequence of papers by Abraham Lempel and Jacob Ziv uh, at Bell Labs at the time, who basically just changed the world of compression uh, in 1977 and 78. So what we'll study today is something, the concept of universal compressors. A universal compressor is a scheme that does well on any stationary input without prior knowledge of the source distribution. So it assumes nothing and still gets you the optimal results. And as part of that, we'll look at really the most common scheme used in compression today, the zip uh, compressor, as, as you might have heard of. Um, so let me define universal compression, just to be slightly formal. So you have a compressor. The compressor has some length function, which is the number of bits it takes to describe xn. And it is universal if the expected length per symbol matches the entropy rate for any stationary ergodic source. Ergodicity is just a technical condition, no need to worry about it. Uh, but really for any stationary source. So for any stationary source, it achieves the entropy rate. No, no like qualifiers, no mention that it will achieve the entropy for a kth order but not for a k plus 1th order, no for any stationary source, however complicated it might be. So really a single compressor is asymptotically optimal, asymptotically because this happens in the limit, for every distribution. Um, for a long time before Lempel and Ziv did their work, people believed this was impossible. So, so like even at the time and even today, this is a very surprising result that such a thing is possible. Uh, and we'll see it's, it's actually very simple. Another sort of on the flip side, a way to think about uh, this in terms of universal prediction. Uh, recall from last lecture that every compressor induces a distribution. So for any compressor which gives you a length function L, you get a p hat which is 2 power minus L. And what this is saying is that a universal compressor's p hat, the, the distribution it's learning over the data, approximates any stationary distribution arbitrarily closely as n grows. So just as like a rough figure. So this is like the p for different stationary distributions, the distribution for all of them basically. And somehow there is this one point here, p hat lz which is close to every other point in the distribution. So there exists one single distribution that's a good approximator of every other distribution. Uh, so I, I spoke of it in a very hand wavy way. You need to rigorously formulate it, which we won't do here, but uh, talk to Saki. He's like an expert in these matters. He has extended the theory of universal compression to universal denoising, universal lossy compression. Uh, and uh, look at his lecture notes or whenever he teaches it next time, this EE376C, which is completely focused on the theory of universal compression and universal denoising and so on. Uh, you can also look at this paper if you're interested. But for now, let's come back to LZ. Any questions on the general concept of universal compression or universal prediction, right? We are just saying that you have a compressor or you have a predictor that works well for any stationary distribution without making any assumptions. And we'll see how, how that happens. Um, okay, so, so the LZ77 or Lempel Ziv family of universal algorithms, there are many, many implementations. So they had two papers, one in 1977, one in 1978, both of them describing different schemes. The one in 1977 is called LZ77, the other one LZ78. And then people made modifications of those by adding different things. Uh, all of these are like used in a bunch of these different compressor compressors. You see GZIP and Z standard, you see PNG, which is an image compressor, ZIP, which is again a very common compressor. You see GIF here, which is image, right? And here are some references if you want to uh, look at these. Uh, we'll look at some of these in more detail as we move along the lecture. But this is just to say that most of the common compressors today 
are built upon some version of Lempel-Ziv. So I don't know if you list, listen to music or to this particular song. The idea of LZ77 algorithms is very simple. History repeats itself. You have some data, you see some sequence, you have probably seen that before in some form or the other. And if you have seen it before, why not just put a pointer that I saw this word 100 words ago or I saw this sentence 1000 sentences ago, something like that, right? This, this song in particular, as you might imagine, is very well compressible with this technique. It just repeats. Each line is a repeat of the previous line. Um, and our TA Noah last time made the class listen to the song. Uh, so that was good. Uh, right. So, so this is the idea, right? Idea is simple. Replace repeated segments in data with pointers and lens. So if you wanted to draw it here, you would say that this around the world. So this A is like this whole thing is a match of this previous thing. So you need to store some length and you need to store this offset. Offset is like how far in the past has this thing occurred and how long is the match. Uh, so with that in mind, let, let, let's just do an example, I think, which will which will give you a very good sense of what we are talking about. So what LZ77, that's the version we will look at in more detail because that's the one used in most of the popular algorithms. Starts, you start with a sequence like this. And then what you do is, you divide it into three streams. One is the unmatched literals, the match length, and the match offset, and, and let's understand these uh, one by one. So, okay. So, I see the first A here. This is the first character. I've never seen it before, clearly, because that's the first character. So, that has to go into an unmatched literal. There is no match. I see a B. I've never seen a B before. It's the first B. So again, that goes into unmatched literal. Now, how about this guy? Have I seen a B before? Yeah, I've, I just saw a B, right? So nice. I got a match. How long is the match? Right, the match is just of length one because I can't extend it, right? Because I've, I've seen B before, but I've never seen B A before. So it's a match of length one at offset one. Right, because it occurred just one character before. Okay. Now, have I seen an A? Have I seen A B? Have I seen A B B? Have I seen A B B A? Right, so here I see some disagreement among the students. I have indeed seen an A B B A. Right. We are seeing this ABBA here and, and we'll, we'll come to like this sort of overlapping matches in a little bit. But for now, trust me. Have I seen ABBABB? Yes, I have. You see, this, this sequence is an exact match of this sequence, right? Uh, at least this I think we can agree with that this ABBABB is match of the previous thing. So there was no, no unmatched literal, nothing here. What's the match length? Six, I hope I heard a six. Okay, what's the offset? How far is the start position of, uh, how far is this from this basically? It's a three, right? Because the, the, the previous A occurred three characters before. So this, okay. Now I get a C. C I've never seen a match, right? So C is unmatched. And then I see a A, B. This one is simple. I just saw an A, B here. Okay, this time please help me. What is the offset? The length is two. What is the offset? Just to make sure people are following. Can you repeat, please? Sorry. Four. 
Yep, so if you call this 0, then this is minus 1, minus 2, minus 3, minus 4. Yes, 4, right. Um, okay, th that, that's it basically, that's LG77. That's how you parse a sequence into these three streams, unmatched literals, match length, and match offset. For now, trust me for just a second on this thing, that this overlapping match thing will be fine, and we will we'll do a decoding very soon. Uh, other than that, any any questions? Okay, good. You will you will get uh, experience on uh, practice on this as usual in the quiz. So we did it at home. We got the same things that we just got, right? Now we will decode it. Um, okay, let's try to decode the same thing. You know the answer, but let, let's try to not. Cheat and actually try to decode it. So, what do I start with? What are, what is the first character? A, right? A and then followed by A followed by a B, right? Because you first copy the unmatched part. Now you have a match length of one and offset of one, right? So the character that's coming here has to be like from here just one past and it has a length, just one length match. So A, B, B, okay. Now you have a match length of six and a match offset of three. Okay, so let's do it character by character. Here I have offset of three. So that goes here, I get A. Then I do the next one here, here, right. So far I think, I hope we are all happy, right. Now we come to that overlapping part. Now I try to decode this thing. But the offset is three and this guy is already decoded, right? This red part. So I can actually decode this one based on this one. This is again A, this is a B, and this is a B. Was that clear? Basically, if you sequentially decode it, it's fine if the matches overlap with each other. Uh, like the match overlaps with itself, really. And then you get a C, which is an unmatched literal. And then you have a match length of two. So you have two things that match at an offset of four. So, so from here you go here. So A, and from here you go here. That's B. Okay. So just wanted to do one example in class so that uh, you can do the quiz question on your own. Um, Right. Okay. So, so, you have the recording. So you can write this in the form of a pseudocode, right? A very, very simple pseudocode. So for an input sequence, which is like x0, x1, dot, 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 right? And suppose we are, we have done until xi minus 1. Then what you will try to do is find the largest k where k is the match length here and i minus j is your offset. So this is basically telling you that xi to xi plus k should match xj to xj plus k. Just the definition of a match that it matches. And if no match found, store as literal. That, that's it basically, right? A very simple, basic idea. Um, the decoding pseudocode, you read any literals and you copy to the output. And if you have a match of length L and offset O, you basically copy it over, right? And there are two cases. One case is if the length of the match is less than the offset. Uh, so that's a scenario like you are here and this is your length of the match. And this is your offset, which is like much bigger than length. So then what you need to do is you just copy this whole thing here. It's a very simple copy operation, right? And the other case, so this is like case one, L less than O, so length is less than offset. And then the case two is where, again, you have a match of length L but offset is very small. So in this case, what happens is the thing overlaps as we just saw. 
and then you have to be more careful when you're decoding it, right? Uh, but what we did it just now, right? If you do it by hand, you can do it. If you do it in code, you can again do it. Uh, so, okay. Okay, so this uh, question will be in your quiz. You will just do the unparsing basically of this guy. We'll ask you to decode it and I think if you decode it, then you have understood the algorithm well enough, right? And actually we, we encoded it in a way that's, that doesn't match the way we... But one thing you will learn very quickly is that there are many ways to encode it with LG77. For example, maybe you are very lazy, you don't try to match anything, you just put everything as a literal. That's a valid LG77 encoding, right? Or you try your very hard and find the best matches. That's also valid LG77 encoding. Maybe you don't allow your match lens to be more than 100 for some reason. That's a valid thing. So there are many encoding choices you can make that all work with the same decoding algorithm. Uh, okay, any, any questions so far? Uh, right, hopefully this is good, okay. So encoding step. Start with the input data, do this LG77 parsing. You get your literals and you get your matches. And then you do some sort of entropy coding. You use one of your things like Huffman coding or ANS or arithmetic coding, which we have been listening about. And then you get the compressed file. Uh, different implementations differ in this and we will we'll come back to this in much more detail uh, shortly. But before we do that, let me spend not too much time, but a little time talking about why, why this works, why is this optimal, right? We, we made a very strong claim that uh, LG77 works for any stationary sequence, irrespective of the distribution. So we should at least try to get some intuition into that, if not the full proof. Okay, so consider this IID sequence. You just have an IID sequence. And if you have a symbol like value A, for example, which has probability P of A, what is the expected gap between consecutive occurrences of A? How far uh, often would like consecutive occurrences of A be on average? Okay, uh, tell me one thing. If A has a high probability, would you occur the gap between consecutive A's to be more or less? Less, right? Because if A is more common, it will occur very frequently. So the gap between consecutive A's will be small, okay? And if A is less likely, then there will be a big gap between consecutive A's. Okay. Then let's try to do it in two steps. So in a block of size n, how many times do you expect to see A? It's IID. The probability of A is P A. Yes, n multiplied by PA, right? Uh, why? Yeah, so the answer was each of them has a probability of PA of being A, therefore the expected number of occurrences will be n times PA. But, but as we, as we saw in the AP lecture or you might have seen before, you can say much more. You can actually say that it, it will actually be very close to n, n times PA because of the law of large numbers, right? So that is correct. And, and in, uh, as n gets larger, you actually see it with a high probability being close to n times PA. Okay. So, so let's say n is like, let's say a thousand and let's say n times PA is 200. So what is your expected gap between consecutive A's? How far apart are A's on average? If you have like, so you have 1000 total and you have 200 A's. Anyone? Anybody? How many think it's four? Five? Okay, I hear five, good. So five is thousand by 200, right? This is just like counting type arguments. 
Right, because you have thousand things and you have two hundred A's, so on average they are like five apart roughly. Okay. So, so really, the average spacing in one over P A, n over n n by n times P A. So one over P A is the average gap between consecutive A's. So now we have this. We will take a very giant leap, and let's not read this. I just pasted it. But really, read this second part. So, if you have some sequence x zero to n minus one, the same sequence x zero to n minus one also occurred roughly these many positions ago. So th we we were just talking about like IID and a single symbol, but you can extend it, this to sequences in a stationary distribution. You can actually show with this Cax lemma that. If you see some sequence of length n now, the average sort of time before, like last time you saw the sequence, is actually one over probability of that sequence. It's like a straightforward extension of like a you saw one by p a ago, x n you saw one by p x n ago. That, that that's sort of like the uh, idea here. And now if you connect it to L G seven seven, this this roughly means that the match offset in L G seven seven is one over p of x n right because this is the offset you you found a match basically you are likely to find a match like these many symbols ago uh, any any questions so far this is very high level proof right like the actual proof will have many nuances and so on uh, which we'll not try to cover here uh, it's in the cover thomas book it's in the e 376c notes and so on uh, right for now this will suffice actually okay actually this so now if you have an integer which is like 1 over p x n right you remember like if you have an integer n then you can use like a fixed length code roughly encode it in log n bits right like uh, the usual thing where you can encode an integer n with log n bits so similarly you can encode this match offset 1 over p with roughly log 1 over p bits what does this log 1 over p remind you of any rule that we have been like talking about from the second lecture basically right the thumb rule of compression that if you can achieve log 1 over p bits you are basically optimal right so minor note that you can show relatively easily that the lengths and literals don't really contribute anything it's really the offsets that take up theoretically uh, all of the space in uh, lc77 so we'll just focus on the offsets and then expanding these many bits log 1 over p xn bits means we are following the thumb rule and we use on average if you take the expectation here you get basically h of xn so therefore for encoding n symbols you are using h of xn bits on average which as we know is the optimal thing to do you can't do better than that and then you just take n to the limit and you get your entropy rate so good so so the idea is as simple as a sequence is likely to be seen one over p of that sequence before and therefore you 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 can encode it with log one over p bits and therefore you can achieve the entropy rate uh, right any questions is the high level sort of flow of logic clear if you are unhappy with like some of the details uh, you have a full right to do so uh, uh, we we can point you to references if you want to look at the uh, actual proof yeah so there are proofs sadly the lc77 proof even though the idea sounds very simple it's it's somewhat tricky to prove uh, lc78 it's like brother is much but much better in terms of theory uh, but there is a reason we'll look at this more because it's used much more in practice so the proofs are not as satisfying from a theory perspective but but the this argument is like the core of the proof and then you need to do a lot of things to actually get there which i have not actually seen so yeah there is another reason like the proof maybe is less important to us in this lecture is that this asymptotic theory like doesn't fully explain how well it does in practice the theory the theoretical proofs are like somehow not able to 
convince us that LG77 should be so good. Uh, for a kth order Markov process, you can show that LG77 will achieve its entropy rate, the conditional entropy in the limit. But for like normal size data, you don't expect it to do so well. Like there is a big, like if you think of terms of like the proof, right? Uh, if something is converging to something, there is a convergence rate. How fast does it approach the entropy rate? And the convergent, convergence rates are not amazing. However, in practice, it does very well on real data, not on these kth order Markov processes. And the reason is, reason is that the world is not really a kth order Markov process. Your English text, you see far longer repeats than you would ever imagine seeing with a kth order Markov process. English is much more complicated. Uh, like a person's name in a text will repeat so many times. If you, if you are trying to model it with a kth order Markov process, you won't be really able to model it very well. Uh, so that's why like we will saw last time, right? These simplistic kth order models and so on. And the LLMs just like beat them by a wide, wide margin because they are able to model it in a much better way than like any of these small order models can do. Of course, in terms of compute, that, that's a different story. Okay. Okay, so that's it for the proof. Uh, we will now look at some practical aspects of LG77. Uh, and I do want to spend some time on like practical tips, which which is new this year. Okay. Um, okay, so what we did as we have been doing is we implemented LG77 in SCL. So we had an implementation from last year and then yesterday night I implemented another one uh, in the last couple of days. So we will look at some, some things uh, about how the matches look in practice, how the match lengths and offsets. Of course, this year, like with chat GPT, the code writing part became much easier. Uh, anyway, so I don't know if anybody identifies this. This is Alice in Wonderland, which is in one of the text, uh, like the standard compression corpuses. So I just uh, took it. And see, this is a match. See, this sort of match, like a kth order model won't explain. Like this is a very long, long match. Beautiful soup, beautiful soup, soup, soup of the evening. So, yeah, right. You see the uh, selected text exactly matches uh, between the two paragraphs, right? LG Samson would just kill it. Like think of it, right? Each of these will take you some number of bits to describe, but LG seven seven, all of this, it would describe in just two numbers, the offset and the length, right? So th that's the whole idea, like the text, after you parse it, it becomes so much smaller and, uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, so this is, uh, I think from a CSS, CSS file, I believe, uh, like this uh, web styling things. And here also you see these very long matches, this transparent 25%, transparent 25%, something, right? So again, again, very suitable for LG77 compression. Uh, but not always do you find these long matches, even short matches are good. And, and we will do some quick math to like uh, make sure uh, that, that that makes sense. So pleasure, this word in this particular book occurs like the first time it occurs and the second time it occurs is like 150 kilobytes, one, so one, one, 150,000 bytes apart. And uh, it's on the first page of the book and the last page of the book. So, let's see if I can find it. Pleasure here, right? And pleasure here, right? So now let's do a quick calculation, just just a back of back of the envelope thing, just to just to compute like, is it worth it to like encode this as a match? So, we saw the best compressors. Uh, spend roughly one bit per byte, but like a usual Huffman coder would spend much more. It would spend like, let's say three bits per byte. That's just a back of the envelope. And pleasure has how many? It has eight characters. So you would spend like 24 bits on it. That's just doing a rough calculation. Okay. Now you have 150 kilobytes, which is what? 150,000. So to describe it, you need roughly these many bits, right? Log of this thing. Can anybody help me? Sorry. Calculate this roughly. If I have a calculator. Yeah. 
I'm hearing waiting. Make sure it's log base two. Okay, somewhere in the 14 to 17 range. 17. 17, good, okay. Okay, point two. Right, so you already see, right, even this very short match at a very long distance, that is still saving you bits by encoding it. And, and like this three bits is not out of random, right, like this is the zeroth order entropy of English as we saw. I think it was actually roughly around four bits. So, right, so you see, the idea here is that far away short matches, even those are beneficial. Because it's so much cheaper to encode this one fifty the, the just the length one fifty thousand as compared to encoding the P L E A S U R E, these eight characters. Uh, right. And you can like play with this more and uh, actually like see that there will be like as as you might imagine, there will be a crossing point where it just if you have a match of length two at a billion offset. At that point you might say, okay, maybe it's not a worthwhile match, but but still it is, like in this case it is a worthwhile match. Uh, okay. And uh, we've just like gathered the data, tried to look at like, what is the distribution of match offsets and match lengths after you do this LG77 parsing for a particular implementation of LG77. We will so see like, it's not like a unique thing. So you see, mostly you have smaller offsets, and sometimes you have bigger offsets. So the, it's an exponential scale, uh, right? So in this case, the longest offsets are around 150,000 because the text itself is around 150,000 long. And in terms of match lengths, you see, oftentimes you see relatively small match lengths. Once in a while, you see like match lengths more than 100 bytes, right? This is very important like to understand that this is for this particular file. From file to file, from data set to data set, this distribution looks different. And that should influence what particular LG77 technique you use, as we'll see shortly. This is the, the CSS file we saw earlier, the one with the percent, 50 percent, that sort of thing. Bootstrap min.css. Match offset maybe looks similar. Match lengths, you will notice here something different, right? There are some extremely long matches, more than like 500 bytes long, right? So you, you can do this for any file and just, just play with it, try to understand, right? Like if you imagine structured pieces of data, like code, for example, would have a lot of matches of the exactly same type like the because the same keywords occur many many times right the same variable names the same function names so that distribution will look different compared to text where you have repeated words but maybe not like repeated sentences exactly uh, right if you have a table like a csv file maybe some of the rows are exact matches of each other so again that's different from like text uh, if you have a random data maybe you don't find any matches or you find very few matches so, so this will be different for different uh, data sets. Okay, any, any questions so far? Right. So just want to say one thing that LG77 is like, I think today the, the most popular compression technique. It's the one that's most widely used in practice to like do full justice to it, to explain even like how gzip works would take me several lectures and to explain how something like Z standard, which is a modern version works, would probably take me the entire course. Plus, I don't think I'm qualified to like actually talk so much about LG77. But we will try to look at some practical aspects of LG77, uh, things that I'm more confident to speak about uh, without bringing in like the creator of these algorithms. Okay. So first thing, this this whole idea is very simple, right? But do I need to keep this infinite past memory? Do I need to keep all of the past at every time? to find matches, like if I have a one gigabyte file, do I need to like keep the last gigabyte in my memory and then look for matches in that last one gigabyte? That that doesn't sound efficient and people don't do that. What people do is use something called a sliding win window LG77 where you only try to find matches in the last 10, 10 kilobytes or a few megabytes, that sort of thing, right? So you, you limit the scope. You don't look for matches that are arbitrarily far away. So that's one thing. And some technical details, like you can use circular buffers, some like particular techniques to efficiently handle windows without reallocating memory every time or moving a bunch of data every time. Uh, and uh, we'll see 
this one in the next slide that bigger windows give you better compression because now you have more basically it's just making the compression uh, encoder more powerful like you can, it can find far away matches but but it needs more memory because then you need to store that entire window with you both in the compression and the decompression uh, we have implemented this in SCL I encourage you to look at it it's I think well documented and uh, uh, I had a hard time like actually finding an implementation that was like easy to explain uh, so I hope I hope this will be useful especially if you are doing a project on this uh, uh, I will mention some like specific project ideas shortly so I took the Alice in Wonderland book I increased the window size like in an exponential scale and I looked at the compressed size in bytes so what you see is that as you expect right as you improve the window you get better and better compression at some point it starts leveling off in this case because the file itself has a certain length so making the window bigger than the file size obviously is not going to help but even in general uh, after a point it doesn't help to have a bigger window um, again this is something which is data specific for your data maybe bigger windows are better or for your application maybe you can afford a lot of memory so it's all about what you want to do uh, there are no like hard rules that always use 100,000 window that's not the lesson of this plot um, another question the, the basic question right we, we, we did it by hand by eye earlier but clearly like a computer won't do that how to find matches match finding this is like the core of a encoder not the decoder this is important to understand no matter how you find the matches the decoder can still decode your data it's an encoder only property this match finding business how do I find a match in the past and the basic idea which again uh, you can find the code is to what you do basically is that you take like all of these different like common patterns like the patterns that you have seen in the past and you say that a, B, C, D has occurred at position 1, position 10, position 15, position 20, let's say. And this guy has occurred at position 2 and position 14 or something, right? So you make this big table where each of these four length sequences, when have they occurred in the past? And now, you are at some point in the file, you see an A, B, C, D. So you see, oh, I have seen A, B, C, D, past occurrences basically. are at 1, 10, 15, 20, right? Because you store this in like a hash table basically. So you store this table, which is like for every four length sequence, when, when have I seen it in the past for all possible sequences. And then when you find a sequence in the future, you look at its past occurrences and you try to see which one of them would give you the longest match. So maybe, maybe you see, saw ABCD at like position 10 in the past and at position 1 in the past. However, in this case, this was followed by EF. In this case, this was, this was followed by like ZX. And here it's followed by EF. So you would prefer the first one, right? This, this seems a better match. This is a longer match instead of this one. So you have like a lot of candidate positions where this ABCD occurred. And then in the past, you look at where did you find a longer match to this ABCD EF. So this is like a basic idea commonly used in many algorithms, like a seed type idea where to find a match, what you do is you take like a four length or a three length, five length seed. Seed is the thing you index in your hash table, right? So in this case, it's all four length sequences that are hashed in the sequence. You use that to find candidate matches and then you find the best match out of those candidate matches. So really like reduces the search space when you're looking for things. So index past occurrences of sequences in a data structure like hash, table, binary tree, you can choose your favorite. And for the given position, do a lookup to find previous occurrences and then extend the candidate match to find the longest match. Right? So you extend it in the future, you see how long does it keep matching. Um, again, Ah, so you are asking why I took four instead of two or three? Yeah. Yes, that's a good question. Um, 
there is a trade off there which we'll see shortly but just to answer the specific thing um, a two length thing would give you a lot of false positives because you have seen ab much more than you have seen the abcd whole thing right so now if you are just indexing two length or three length you will find many more possible things so it will increase your complexity quite a bit just to like find all of the possible to find the longest one on the other hand if you really work hard you will actually find maybe a better match than you would find with a four length thing so so that's the trade off basically it will often make you slower but maybe better compression but in practice we'll see even that is not true for for a particular reason um but yes if you make it too big that's very bad because then you will miss out on a lot of matches um okay another sort of uh, thing that's like not immediately obvious is that the the lg77 that we presented like the theoretical version that is greedy greedy means that the first time it sees a match it picks up that match it doesn't think of the future it doesn't do try to do some complex optimization problem where oh maybe i should not take this match maybe i should take a longer match in the future let let me give you an example i'll make it very clear so okay so let's say this is your sequence at some point in the past you saw like b c d e f let's say b b c e d e f a b e f a b c d okay so now you are here so the algorithm we we were just discussing you would see an a b you will see oh i found a match to a b and you will say good i am done right uh okay however maybe you can be smarter you you might say okay maybe i saw this match of a b but it's too short it's just of length 2 what if i skipped a let's me let me skip a let me try to find a match starting at b and suddenly i find a very long match a match of length 5 instead of length 2 right so the first one is greedy this one is like the the first one is greedy because it it just like takes the first thing and says okay that's it the second one is lazy lazy in the sense that it says okay maybe i found a match but let's not get too excited let's look a bit in the future maybe i will find a better match let's not pick it up right away uh does that make sense right and as you can imagine like the real like people who have looked into this didn't stop at this lazy right this seems like okay but how do you exactly do the lazy thing they said okay let's make it into an optimization problem let's solve like a perfect optimization problem let's make a dynamic program out of it uh and you you can do a lot of things there is something called optimal parsing there is a big theory around it where what is the lg77 parsing that gives you the fewest number of literals or that gives you the best compression but they just get progressively slower and slower the more complex your strategy is right so you can imagine greedy is very fast because you just take the first match right lazy is slower because you don't take sometimes matches then you try in the future try to find a longer match and leave some things as literals is this concept clear roughly that uh, sometimes being greedy is not the best option right you sometimes want to be a bit lazy see if there is a better match in the future okay so just just to like show you like what a typical uh, encoder would be structured like so this is from the scl class uh, sliding sliding window encoder so the encoder would take a match finder which basically gives you the matches and it would take a window size which is the size of the window and then the match finder would have like some some way to extend matches but really the main function is this find best match where given some sequence it will try to find the best match and there can be various implementation you could have a lazy thing greedy thing just a bunch of different ideas there optimal thing and then this particular match finder we implemented you see it has so many parameters hash length which is like 4 uh, in the example we just uh, we were talking about there is a hash table size because you don't want like an arbitrary large hash table something on max chain length which we will not talk about uh, whether you are lazy or whether you are greedy is there a minimum match length uh, so 
This is just like an implementation I did. If you look at Z standard or Gzip, they have more more complexities around it. But 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 you can imagine that like that the really nice thing is that all of these are compliant with the same decoder. The decoder is not changing, right? We are just playing with the encoder, trying to find a better and better parsing of the data while using the best decoder. And that's a very nice idea because that allows you to, without breaking your consumers, people who are reading your files, they can keep using the same decoder. But you just get better and better compression by using these fancy complex strategies. Uh, okay, are we happy? Or at least satisfied, okay. Um, okay. So this is a, like an experiment I did where I had something called a minimum match length, which is like, what is the shortest match I'm going to allow? And I kept increasing the minimum match length for again this Alice in Wonderland book. And what I'm showing here is that as I increase the minimum match length, I get more and more literals, but fewer and fewer matches. Can somebody roughly explain why that might be happening? So I'm basically rejecting any match that's shorter than a particular match length. Why, why would I see more literals as I increase my match length? Yeah, yeah. The answer is if you don't have a match, you have to store it as a literal, right? And now you're disallowing a lot of matches. Any short sequence you don't even allow as a match. So therefore you just get much more unmatched literals. And therefore you pay less to store the matches because they are just fewer matches, right? You only take very long matches. You say, no, short matches are not something I care about. However, you see there is a trade-off now because you get more and more literals, fewer and fewer. Uh, so, so there is like some, some sort of middle ground where you don't want your minimum match length to be too small. If it's too small, literals, you do, you, everything matches. But then you have just too many matches. You have too many matches of like length one, length two. And those matches cost a lot. Maybe it's better to not have these super small matches, instead like use a bigger match uh, and then like leave a few literals. So so there is a trade-off as, 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 as in a lot of things. Um, and then this is another thing I did where I looked at the lazy and the greedy strategy, again for this particular file, where the greedy strategy just picks the first match it finds of that minimum match length. The lazy strategy tries to go a bit further, sees if it can find a bigger match, and if it finds a bigger match, it takes the bigger match instead of taking the greedy match. And you see that the lazy strategy like always outperforms the greedy strategy in this case uh, for any, any minimum match. So yeah, I encourage you to look at the code. I think uh, only once you look at it and you think about it a little bit, you will appreciate this more and more. But but the, the basic point I'm trying to make is lots of choices you can make at the encoder, which lead to maybe it makes it slower, but better compression, or it takes more memory, but better compression. So there are all these trade-offs. Uh, any questions so far on this match finding? Uh, so one thing we tried to do in the, in the implementation in SCL is we tried to, not like this here, try to separate the match finder so that you can like plug and play. You can try different match finders with the same encoder. The decoder doesn't change, just the encoder you can, you can implement your own favorite match finder. You can implement some DP dynamic programming based thing. Okay. Um, and then obviously you need to entropy code everything, right? It's not enough to just, just producing these is not enough, right? At the end of the day, you need to actually store it in bits. And that's again something people have played with a lot. The current sort of standard thing that everybody does. This is not what gzip does. gzip does it a bit differently, but all the modern compressors do this. Is uh, you take uh, all the unmatched literals in a block, you concatenate them together into like a single long thing, and then you store like the number here, 504, the length here. So really what you get, this is sort of a technical point, but really what you have is you have the literals, which is a sequence of just like bytes, and you have three integer sequences, literal counts, lit match length, match offset. Uh, very technical point, don't worry about it too much, but this is how everybody does it nowadays. And then you have to encode each of these, and we have all of the entropy coders we saw, right? 
So, so that's the power of these entropy coders because all LZ77 is doing is, is converting your very complex stationary distribution into a much simpler IID like distribution. So now you can use your favorite coders for IID distribution and they will basically give you the results. Right. So you can use Huffman coding. Gzip just uses Huffman coding. Z standard uses Huffman for literals. You can use TANS, which is like recently becoming more popular. Uh, C standard uses it for, oh, what are these? Not for literals. It uses for mass lengths and offsets. Yeah. Or you can use context-based arithmetic coding, which is very slow to encode and decode. Uh, which is what LZMA or XZ or 7-zip all these guys use. Or you could just skip entropy coding, say that, okay, I don't care. I will just use a simple code. I won't do like any fancy entropy coding because yeah, I want to be very, very fast. And that's what LZ4 and Snappy do. Uh, all these names probably don't sound very familiar to you. Uh, and, and that's fine. I think really there are only a couple of compressors you should know about really. And then everything else you can if you only need, if you need it, you look at it sort of. Let me skip this slide. It's like a technical point point about how do you actually entropy code integers. Uh, please read it at home. Okay, so really the lesson is that the parsing or match finding strategy, the window size, the entropy coder, implementation details like are you using SIMD, are you using these advanced instructions, are you parallelizing things, matter a lot in determining speed and memory usage. So let's look at this plot. So this is showing Z standard, which is a modern LZ77 based compressor and Zlib, which is the library behind Gzip, which is a older, around like 30 years old now uh, compressor. The X axis is compression speed. The Y axis is compression ratio. And where you want to be is on this side, basically. You want higher speed lower compression ratio, uh, sorry, higher speed and higher compression ratio. And you see, and, and the different dots here are the different levels, like different parameters, where you take a bigger window or you use a more powerful entropy coder, uh, sorry, not uh, use a more powerful match finder. And you see that Z standard just like beats CLIP on all fronts, partly because it has better algorithms, partly because it uses more memory, partly because it is implemented better use, to use modern hardware instructions. So all of these things matter. These small decisions end up like impacting where you lie in this curve, basically. Uh, and this is decompression speed where, again, Z standard achieves like amazing results. It's like 1.4 GPPS in this for this for some data set. Uh, again, this is mostly because of how the decoder is implemented. That's a big role. And also because how they structured the format, which is a bit technical. LZMA uses arithmetic coding, so it's just very slow to decode, sadly. Arithmetic decoding, as we saw, is slow to decode. Um, another thing you notice is that we don't show any levels here, and the reason is that regardless of what match finding you use, the decoding stays the same. Decoding is just copying stuff from the past, so it, it, it affects it slightly, but not too much. The different encoders can still produce the same sort of decompression speed. And then, yeah, you can just like look at so many different LZ77. Each of them have their own levels from one to whatever. You have Z standard, Zlib is Gzip basically. You have Broadly from Google. You have LZ4 again from Jan Collett who also wrote Z standard. You have Snappy from Google. So just all these guys keep making their own versions. Uh, and, and we'll look at like for like a practitioner, how do you think about these? There are so many compressors. Like you Google data compression, you get like a million results, what do you do? Uh, before we go there, just a quick note that universal doesn't mean perfect, right? LZ77 is universal in an asymptotic sense. Like as n goes to infinity, it will achieve the entropy road for any stationary distribution. But your data is probably not infinitely large, right? It's a finite thing. So it need not be the best choice for your particular data set, right? Even if it is the perfect choice in terms of compression ratio, maybe it is too slow for you, maybe it has too high of a memory usage, right? So all these things should go into your calculation. Just don't think that like LZ7 is universal. So that's what I will use. I will never consider any other compressor. That, that, that's, no, that's not how we should think. 
and obviously as we saw right gzp is lg77 c standard is lg77 but they are not the same so there are a lot of like beyond this base algorithm the basic idea that works in theory there are so many like minor things you can do which or major things you can do which really change the world okay so that's it on lg uh, we didn't talk about lg78 it is very interesting i think i encourage you to read up on it or do a project on it if if you want to uh Saki covers it in much detail in E376C. The course is called Universal Schemes in Information Theory. Uh, it, it's a bit like theoretical course. I think quite a while since it was last uh, taught. But I think we, we can share the notes with you if you are interested in the theory aspect here. And there are a lot of things in LG77, uh, things like rep codes, optimal parsing, which we don't have time to cover here. All of these are good project ideas. Talk to us and we can point you to the relevant resources. Uh, okay, so that's, uh, so short, like the summary is that LG77 is a great compressor, right? So now, but you have been like, every compressor we teach you, we tell it's, it's a great idea. Last time we said context-based arithmetic coding is great. Before that Huffman was great. Uh, every Everybody seems optimal in some sense. Uh, so how, how do you think about data compression? Okay. So you have a lot of data. You want to compress that data. First thing, first thing always to think about. Is it possible you don't need all this data? Do you really need this data? Maybe just delete it, right? Uh, really, this is very important. And like, that, that's how like most of the cost savings come from because you just identify that, oh, I don't need this exabyte of data. Let's just uh, delete the data. And, and that's basically saving you like millions of dollars. Okay. So again, maybe you can't delete the whole thing, but maybe you can identify with whatever you have learned that some parts of the data are costing you more than other parts of the data. Let's say you are writing a log. Maybe there are multiple fields in the log, let's say. Maybe some fields are much more compressible. Things that look very long, like if you have a log of some, like, some, some sort of web server log, for example, it will have like the host name. But maybe the host name is the same for every log line because the host name is the name of that host, right? It's the IP address of that host. So anything that just keeps repeating is going to be very compressible, even if it looks long. But maybe there is some request ID or some access ID or something, which is like a random small string. It looks very small when you look at it in the uncompressed domain, right? If you have like, like if you have host name, which is like 10.1, sorry, 10.1.1.1. Well, something like this. And then that just repeats every line. So this is like, even though it looks long, it's like easy to compress. It doesn't take any bits in the compressed domain. But maybe you have this like random thing, x, y, a, c, x, x, b, d, c, something like this. Right? This is very hard to compress. So so that, that sort of thing, like after you do a compression class, you should have some intuition that like does do does my identifier, my UUID, some unique identifier, does it need to be so random? Does it need to be 64 bytes? Can I do it with like 10 bytes? Can I make it sequential instead of random? So just, just like this is how, how you can think about it, right? For any, any type of data, uh, just to clog as an example. If you're storing this data, right? And again, I'm thinking more from like a company perspective rather than personal storage. But even personal storage, I do take these photos. Do you need all of them to look at them really? So uh, for companies, obviously, sometimes there are legal requirements. You need to keep some data for some time or on maybe there are reasons you want to keep it. So sure, okay, maybe you need to keep the data, but, but think hard about this. And finally, think about like, what is your data access pattern? Take photos, for example, right? Photos, maybe you don't, you, you want to keep them. Maybe in future, at some point, you want to look at them. But it's not like you're going through your like one-year-old photos every day. So maybe you store it in a cheaper cold storage sort of thing, rather than storing it like in the most expensive uh, storage, right? So just just like a computer, if you have read about cache, uh, cache in your computer, right? It, it keeps the things that are more frequently accessed in a very sort of expensive storage. And it keeps everything that's used less in like RAM or on disk or something. Similarly, store your data in that way. And finally, for a lot of types of data, you can't do lossless compression and be like practical. Videos are the prime example of that. And that's basically the next half of the course where 
Sometimes just lossy compression, it's just unreasonable to do lossy compression. So, okay. And, and one more thing before you like get too discouraged, right? Why do we learn all this if we are just going to delete all of our data? Compression is not only about storage, it, it reduces memory, it reduces bandwidth. You can sometimes query your data faster with compression. So many times you need to do compression and you, you need to know how to do compression. Okay, any, any questions? Uh, yeah. Some of this might sound like a joke, but like when we talk to people and like this is what the unique thing you can offer, like once you know about compression, many of these things are not at all obvious to people, like this thing where people think that, oh, this is so long, this should be very like hard to compress, right? But now you know that the entropy here is like zero basically because everything is the same, right? You can easily predict the next one based on the previous one, where here, here you have a lot of entropy. Predicting the next one is not because they are random actually, right? So this is a sort of intuition that will be useful like when you when you look at a real application. Okay, so now you decide, okay, I need to store this data losslessly. Now what? Now, now what's the next step? So things not to do. Okay, so maybe you think, okay, I learned E274. Now I'm very like smart. I can, I will just implement my own compressor, right? I will like use LG77 and I will use Huffman or maybe I will just design my own uh, own LLM or something. Okay, don't do this. And I, I will talk about why. Or maybe you think, okay, I will not implement, like I will not discover a new algorithm or invent a new algorithm, but I know all these LG77 entropy coders. So let me, let me implement them, right? Uh, let me implement them from scratch in Python or in C. Or maybe you say, no, I'm just not up to it. I didn't like listen in the lectures carefully enough. I will just Google search online and like see some like uh, very expensive compressor and just buy the license to it. Or, or maybe you just like listen to some small part of this lecture, you decide, oh, LG77 is universal. GZIP is an implementation of LG77. It has to be the perfect compressor, right? You didn't listen to the lecture very carefully. And okay, and that's the popular thing, right? Everybody says GZIP is the compressor to use. Okay, sure, we'll use that. So don't do this, right? Uh, use your like uh, skills from this class. All of these can make sense, but not as the first step. The first thing you should do is to understand your application. Why are you using compression? What is the need? And where are you using compression, right? So what's the speed you need? What's the memory usage you need? Where is the compression happening? Is it happening on your own machine? Is it happening on somebody else's machine? Is it an open source library? Is it a closed source thing within your organization? Is it like a hobby project? Is it like something that needs to be used in production on like uh, like gigabytes or petabytes of data? How will compression and decompression happen? We, we don't talk about it as often, right? But gzip, z standard, all of these have a CLI. They have a command line interface. You can like run it like z, z standard dash c whatever whatever. Or they have a library. There is a C library, Python library, Java library all languages imaginable, there is a Z standard or a gzip library. So where will it happen? Is the data homogeneous, right? Like, so for example, uh, do you have like a lot of genomics data? So all of the data looks similar to each other. Or are you like a cloud storage service where everybody wants to store their data on your system? So therefore the data is not up to you. Everybody else decides what data they put in your thing. So whether the data is homogeneous or not will influence how you design your compressor. Right, if it's homogeneous, if you have a lot of the data of the same kind, you have lots of genomics data, maybe you want to design your own special compressor for genomics. But if it's not homogeneous, if other people are putting in their data, you don't know what the data is going to be. So then maybe you should use a universal compressor like LZ. Right? So all of this should influence like how you think about uh, building your own thing or not building your own thing. So one thing I, I find often useful uh, is to use these benchmarks that are people have done or you can do. Uh, the idea is that you take some corpus, you take some data set, like maybe you take genomics data, maybe you take a mixture of different types of files, you run a bunch of different compressors in their different parameters, and then you make, make a plot. So you make a plot like this one. So the x-axis is compression speed, so this is better basically. Let me just write faster compression. And this is more compression. 
and you see for example that if speed is your thing lz4 is the way to go there is nobody like even close to it it's just like several times faster than everybody else maybe if you want like the extreme compression then these things called zpack or cmix or these very very slow but very powerful compressors maybe those are the way to go maybe you want something in between so maybe you want to use c standard maybe you want something slightly slower than z standard that gives you better compression so maybe use bzip2 or bsc these might just sound like names to you if you have not heard of them but basically like these are the popular compressors that many times people would want to consider in this plot uh, this green one is gzip this uh, brown one is z standard would you ever use gzip over z standard by looking at this plot right the top right is the better direction right and you see like just z standard every level of z standard is just better than z standard just gives you a better uh, parity optimal sort of frontier as compared to gzip right because it's like very similar idea but just modern uh, it does use more memory so if you are like running on a raspberry pi or you're running on like a 1970s computer for some reason then you want to use gzip because gzip can work with like even kilobytes of memory versus z standard would at least take megabytes yeah, when i was small i had a computer which was like 128 mb total ram so there i could imagine like z standard would might may be too expensive but really today it's not not that common same for decompression speed so this is like uh, faster decompression and this is this is more compression basically so again the, the y axis is the same and here you again see lz4 is the clear winner right fast fast compression or fast decompression just use lz4 don't worry about anything else all of them have like multiple parameters so that's why you see multiple points corresponding to the same thing z standard is very fast broadly is very fast gzip is slower but still pretty fast and the reason is all of these are based on lz77 and lz77 so what, is, what about the memory usage for gzip and gstandard yeah yeah so gstandard uses more memory because it by default uses a bigger window than gzip gzip the maximum window is like i think 32 kilobytes or 64 kilobytes something like that gstandard you can increase it to even gigabytes if you want to but by default it's like a few megabytes so the memory usage of gstandard is like in tens of megabytes typically whereas gzip is like a couple megabytes or less so that's the rough like thing most applications today i think are fine with the z standard memory usage but if you are in a very constrained host or like constrained system then you might not be able to do it yeah yeah so that's like a trade off they made like it's not like z standard is just better on every front there is still like the memory front where it's not so good but i think it's just made for a modern age per gzip like made some decisions for example they they fix their maximum window size to be this 32 kb or 65 or 4 i don't remember there is no way in the format to allow it to increase z standard learned from this that lesson they don't put a upper limit on the window size they say maybe in future there will be a machine which will be able to handle a 1 gigabyte or a 1 terabyte window why not let it use that we'll just so there are like these decisions that people make so i think z standard was much more careful in like making these decisions on like what the format is uh, in that sense you can use the standard with a very low memory if you use a very small window um, yeah and then if you want more compression but you are fine with slower decompression use uh, bsc or bzip which uh, i will talk about in a second but yeah so the point i was making was that lz77 is fast at decompression because the decompression as you saw before is just copying from the past and mem copies are very fast there isn't like a lot of logic there you do huffman decoding you do ans decoding all of them are very fast and then you just copy stuff from the past uh, so so general rule of thumb is z standard has a very fast decompression at any level it has a lot of level, levels it should be the first thing to try i think in today's age if you are given a compression problem try z standard first and don't use gzip unless you have a very good reason maybe you have some compatibility reason lot of people have like if you are writing data that other people need to read and they don't have z standard on their system then maybe you need to write gzip but other than that really don't don't use gzip to go even faster try lz4 so what lz4 does different from z standard is that lz4 has a very fast match finder and it doesn't do any entropy coding so it it skips the ans or the huffman step it just encodes it with some fixed number of bits so it's it's so much much faster in that way 
now if you want to go a bit slower right you think that okay i, I need to store this data for 10 years i don't like work with it so often it's more for an arch archival type use case maybe you want like a better compressor so now there are two choices mainly like one is this lz ma based compressors which are again lz77 followed by arithmetic coding which we know can be more powerful than like huffman or ans uh, because you can do context based coding and xz if you have heard of it or 7zip are like prime examples of this or you use something called bwt based compressors which we didn't talk about in the class at all uh, i will let you look at it in the homework there is a question in the homework that will teach you about bwt burrows wheeler transform it's a way to transform the data to make it very compressible right and bwt is faster than lzma typically at compression but slower at decompression because the decompression is no longer just copying it it does more advanced things and then if you are even more resource intensive you should do like make your own model do context based coding which we learned in the last lecture and then if you have like nothing to do like you are just sitting idle you are okay to have your data be compressed in a 100 years use use these super <coughs> small compressors this is today right maybe 5 years later things will change maybe we will have gpus on every machine or something anyway right and now now if you decide you want to use z standard you want to use it correctly right use the latest version obvious thing for any software or like latest stable version obviously yeah choose the right level right there are like levels 1 to 19 there are negative levels there are some ultra levels above 19 there is a big range of compression speed compression ratio trade off you can choose with z standard and sometimes you want to go beyond this maybe these levels are not enough as we saw in the past right you have the hash length min match length dot 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 all these parameters levels are just like specific combinations of these parameters you can go even deeper you can like define your own z standard custom encoder by choosing this special parameters you can use the cli you can use the library in the language of your choice this is like a common mistake that people do like if you are using z standard in like c or java or python rust whatever if you are compressing multiple files one after the other you don't need to like drop or delete your z standard context every time you can reuse it so that that speeds up your application quite a bit if you are like compressing a bunch of small files one after the other and then if you have very very small files where you don't expect to find good matches within the file you use something called dictionary compression which is again a problem in homework 3 uh, this is a very very interesting topic which i hope you will enjoy also has some of my favorite uh, cartoon characters so that's good uh okay and i think this is the last yep yep so follow up question is so the standard is better than Is that only true because we have much bigger, uh, like in terms of performance, we have much bigger context window, and which we can find matches is it still better if we limit it to 64 KB? Yeah, it's a good question. Does is the standard only better because we give it a bigger window? No, there are many things they do. One thing is they replace the Huffman coding used for the match positions and lengths with TANS, which is a better, better compressor as we saw it. It was much closer to arithmetic coding, so that's one thing. then z standard has many more advanced match finding strategies many of which actually only make sense at longer context windows so gzip uses a very simple hash based match finder z standard has many other things there and the last thing is the z standard is just written better both the compressor the decompressor the format all of which is written in a way to minimize the number of loops loops are very expensive in modern hardware so they did, did it in a way which is like very suitable for the today's like uh today's like uh, uh, architectures the computer architecture stuff uh so all of that basically contributes see see it, it's not like you shouldn't think z standard is better compression than z stand uh, than gzip it's like at the same compression ratio z standard is faster or at the same speed z standard gives you a smaller file right so basically when z standard is doing the same thing that gzip is doing it does it, it does it faster so that gives it a boost basically Right. so it's not only better compression it's also better speed because they implemented it much better because the architecture has changed over time right it's important like we are not saying gzip is bad like when it was made it's a very 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 efficient piece of code for the 1990s today like that that's not like the thing you want to use uh, so last point is that okay now you you looked at all of those you still think no i, I have like 
exabytes of my data, I want to make something special for my data. Or I have like genomics or some special application. I want to make my own compressor. So just, just a few things that you want to think about before you start making your own compressor. One thing is that you checked out Z standard and Gzip and Bzip2 and all of these, and you found that the gap between them and your estimate of the entropy. You, you, you can build your own models. You, you make your probability model. You try to estimate what is the entropy of my data. And you see, oh, Z standard gives me 100 KB, but my entropy is around 50 KB. So there is like a 50 KB gap between the entropy and my data. So therefore, maybe I can do better. So that's sort of one thing. Another thing is that, okay, Z standard gives me very good compression, but it just wastes a lot of time because it doesn't know that my data is a table or my data is a genomic data or my data is a CSV file or it's like some specific type of data. So maybe if I know that I'm, see, Z standard is a general purpose compressor, right? So it has to work for every type of data. But your special compressor only needs to work for one kind of data. So it has more flexibility in the design. It can do things that Z standard cannot do because it knows that your data is going to be a CSV file or it's going to be a, a genomics data set or some other thing. Another thing is like if you're going to make your own domain specific compressor, it's easier if it's like a closed ecosystem, you're working within a company or something because it's not just about the compressor, right? If, if there are like a hundred different people reading the compressed files with their own libraries, their own tools, you suddenly break everyone. As soon as you say, oh, I'm not using gzip or z standard, I will use my own like, uh, like dot shubham or something like that, right? I, I will make my own compressor, I will just use my own compressor, but the other people don't know how to decode your compressor, so how will that work? So so your thing should only will only work if it's a closed, it's much easier to work if it's a closed ecosystem. And final thing is like it's only worth it if you have a lot of data of that kind or you can't live without it basically. You should have a very strong case because a compressor needs design, it needs implementation, it needs a lot of testing. You need to create a compression format, right? You, you did this, that float question when you did the assignment, right? It was so tricky to like store those floats. Uh, so many different ways of doing that with all their trade-offs. Think about like a full-fledged compressor. So many different choices you need to make when you like define the format. And once you define the format and you say I'm at version one, then you're stuck basically. Then you should not change your compressor. If you change your format, then your other people's decoders will break and everybody will be very unhappy. I got a Z standard file, but your Z standard decoder is not working. So, so just you need to be like very careful about backwards compatibility, that sort of thing. You need to monitor how it's work, working. You will find bugs, right? Gzip, even if it's like 30 years old, they found a bug in it like last year. So it's still like, uh, you need to maintain it for a very, very long time. And then you need to not only implement it once in C or Python or something, you need to have it be supported in like, you should have a Java library, you should have a C library, Python library, dot, dot, dot. You need to have it work on like today's machines. You need to work, have it work on like yesterday's machines and like, 30 year old processors, different architectures, different operating systems. So yeah, only do it if, if it's worth it basically, that, that's the point. Uh, like yeah, in a big company you can often find cases where it is worth it. Or if that is your whole product, maybe you find a case where it is worth it, right? Genomics for example, is a domain where there's a lot of data of the same kind and it is definitely worth it doing a custom compressor and they did it basically. But then everybody writes a paper improving it slightly in a breaking manner but nobody uses those particular things, right? Like basically if you have a million different domain specific compressors, how, how, how is anybody going to interoperate, right? Like we have our language like English or any other language. If everybody decided I will use my own language, that's not going to work. So just, yeah, there is a limit to like when domain specific compressors work, but they do work. And uh, if you have a domain that you're interested in, and if you think a domain specific compressor is the right thing, please come to us and we'll, we'll do a project basically. Yeah, do a project on that basically. Last year, like people did on MRI data, I think, and a few other types of like specific data that they were working with. So that's all on lossless compression. Pulkit will see you on Wednesday. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your patience.